Our first reading is Psalm chapter 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the water. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in His temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as King forever. The Lord gives strength to His people. The Lord blesses His people with peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite Serena and any children present to please come forward. Easton, Melanie, she's two now, happy birthday, hi Robbie, well good morning, so I have a question for you, I am curious to know, have you ever known a bully, or been bullied? Somewhat, you know what? I've seen someone get bullied. You've seen other people get bullied. I might have been bullied without me knowing Without even knowing it, maybe you were bullied. <laughs> That's okay. You, you know what? I, I had a bully in second grade, and she used to like to push me down. And I did not like that at all. And, you know, sometimes when people are bullies, they like to hurt people to see what happens, or they like to trick people. And there's something going on in their lives that we can pray for bullies, but because uh, that's not really who they are, but that might be how they're acting. But uh, do you know that Jesus had a real bully? He had a real bully. And I'm going to tell you about that real bully in just a second. Hold on, because I want to let you know that first, the gospel lesson today, we're going to hear about that, we're going to hear a lot of things, but it starts out like this. Jesus is baptized, right? You remember that wonderful story where John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove and is on his shoulder and the clouds open and God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, my beloved son. And everyone knows this is the son of God right here. God is even saying so. How amazing is that? I'm with you, Tommy. I know. I know. I'm with you. I don't understand that either. So then, 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 everything was good. And then it wasn't. Well, then the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. He was really hungry. And the, the big bully, who's the big bully? It's the devil. You knew it. The big bully. You were going to say it. That's right. The devil is the big bully. That's right. Now, the devil is evil. 
God is good. That's right. High five. So the devil, right, is tempting Jesus, and he tempts him three times. And he's, he asks him, well, why don't you just make these rocks into bread? And then he says, well, why don't you go up to the top of that building and jump down, and the angels will catch you. You're Jesus, right? And then he tells him also later, well, if you just follow me, I'll give you all the things of the world, everything in it. Jesus knows better. Jesus uses God's word over and over and says, God doesn't want me to do that. I don't need any of those things. This isn't what my plan is. This isn't what God has planned for me in this world, right? Okay, you know what? But he had a plan. He had something that he was supposed to be doing for God, and he didn't need that. He is also God. Remember that. Yes, he could have done all those things, but he didn't need to. He didn't need to do that. So he kept giving the devil the word of God. He kept using scripture over and over and over. And do you know what? We are going to be tempted in our lives even though we're followers of Jesus, doesn't mean that it's always going to be easy. The devil likes to be a bully to people who are following Jesus because it threatens him. It makes him feel scared, right? <laughs> Basically, you're tempted to eat candy. We can talk about that one. You might be tempted to eat candy. Um, the devil tempts, God tests. Okay, so there are difference, differences there. But... Jesus had something that he was able to overcome the devil with. And it was something that we have also, right? And when we do things, when we do things or we find ourselves in scary situations, right? We have, we have to put on the full armor of God every day. One part of the armor of God is the sword of the spirit. Okay, the sword is right here with us, by the way. Guys, where's the sword? You see the sword? You see the sword? Where's the sword of the Spirit? You think up there? I don't see a sword up there. Do you see a sword over here? It's right here. It's right here with us. Do you see it? You can physically see it right now. Can you? Yes, right here. No guesses? Yes, this right here is the sword of the Spirit, God's Word. So basically, it, but that is what we call the sword of the Spirit. Now hold on, now hold on, hold on, hold on. This is God's Word, right? This is how God tells us to live our lives. This is Him speaking to us, telling us His awesome message of how He saved us how he rose again, what we have to look forward to as believers. And this is why it's important to know your Bible and to study it and to learn scripture. Because when Satan comes and bothers you, you can give him God's word. And like Jesus said, at the end of those temptations, Jesus said, go away, get lost. And you know what? He did. And we have the ability, because we are children of God, to call. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, his dying, his rising, we have the ability to say, go away, Satan. I'm a child of God. And use God's scripture against Satan. Okay, so I have a little challenge for you. I'm going to give each of you one of these after worship, okay? And you get to memorize these Bible passages. If you memorize all these Bible passages, and I'm not going to give you a certain time frame, have your parents sign them, I'm going to get you something really special that's going to help you to grow closer in your faith to Jesus. And I will also give you a piece of candy at the end. All right? So right now, let's go ahead and ask God for help with this, because we do need his help. This is not something we can do on our own. All right? And you can repeat after me, okay? So let's fold our hands. Dear God, dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. The Bible. Bible. Help us to learn it. Help us to learn it so we can stand tall in faith, so we can fall faith and overcome the temptations, overcome the temptations of the devil. Of the devil. Amen. All right, you do get a piece of candy, and I will give you these afterwards.
invite you to stand for our gospel reading this morning. And Serena, I'm glad you didn't give them swords. <laughs> our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through chapter 4, verse 11. Then Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and he will, lift up, he will lift you up with their hands, so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Um, the... Uh, Christmas season is just recently passed, and if you just stop and kind of peruse the Bible, you'll realize that there are only two accounts of the birth of Jesus in the Bible. There's the account in the book of Luke, and there's the account in the book of Matthew, but it doesn't say anything about the, book, the birth of Jesus in the book of Mark or in the book of John. It's interesting, right? You would think that's one of the main stories of the Bible. That should be in all the Gospels, but it's not. You know what it is? The baptism of our Lord. It's in every one of the Gospels. And the temptation of our Lord is in three of the Gospels. That must be equally as important, don't you think? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? How often we kind of take for granted the importance of Christmas, but yet we tend to not think of the baptism of the Lord and His temptations being all that big of a deal. But it is. And I hope to impress upon you today that this is indeed very critical for your and my walk with him and our spiritual growth and development. It all begins with a simple little four-letter word, then. Then. See, then connects the two main parts of the narrative today. Oftentimes, I've, actually I've never taken the text the way we did today and connected the baptism with the temptation. But if you look at the book of Mark, it says, then immediately, or at once, depending on the version that you read, immediately after Jesus was baptized, at once, he went into the desert. There is a boom, correlation, one to one. The two are directly tied together. And so today, instead of just dealing with the baptism of our Lord, I think it's important to see how his baptism is tied to his temptation. See, he was baptized, and then he enters into a battle. He hears a voice from heaven, and then he hears a voice from hell. He's comforted and affirmed, but then he enters the conflict. He's in the water, and then he's in the desert. There is a strong correlation between these two events. See, in baptism, something happens. Reminds me of an old Stevie Wonder song, Signed, Sealed, Delivered, I'm Yours. That's what happens in baptism. 
God seals us, He marks us, He makes us His own. We are His. We enter into a whole new kingdom. We're born spiritually. We're made alive. And when that happens, the devil gets a little bit frustrated because he's just lost one that he thought was his own. And so immediately he begins the temptation. In a lot of our older Lutheran liturgies, you would actually hear of baptism as being an exorcism, that the devil is cast out at baptism. And the Spirit of God enters in, and you're made a whole new person. It was an exorcism. Now, modern-day people, if I were to bring up a baby and tell people we were doing an exorcism, they would look at you weird, wouldn't they? You would. But the reality is that's exactly what's happening. It's exactly what's happening. When somebody's baptized, they enter into a whole new world, become part of the kingdom of light, and are snatched out of the kingdom of darkness. Many times people think of baptism more like as a dedication, like, oh, we're giving them into the hands of God, and it's nice, but, you know, you really can't be baptized until you have this age of consent and things like that. And ultimately, where they kind of go to is this idea that when you baptize somebody, you're kind of getting them on the path to easy street. You've got them into this holy, divine fire insurance program that says, now the devil can't touch him, and so my life is going to be easier. Well, that's stinking thinking, because that's not how it works at all. And Jesus' life gives you testimony to that. What happened to Jesus immediately at once after he was baptized? The temptations came, and he was attacked by the enemy in a strong way. The battle is on. It's not easy street. This is where it goes. Actually, was um, every once in a while, I'll start surfing YouTube for a, a way to put myself to sleep at night. And I have this one woodworking channel that I watch where this guy takes these huge log planks and he makes tables out of them, right? And I kind of like this guy for whatever reason, but I was watching one of his videos the other night and he ran into a problem, and he started, he said, yeah, life, this is hard. This, this stuff is hard. And he said, that was one of the best lessons for me to ever learn in my life. And he started talking about how he was remodeling a home. And he said, it, the plumbing in that house was such a mess. He called the plumber, and the first plumber said to him, I won't do that job. It's too big of a pain. He called the second plumber. The second plumber said, I'm not going to do that job because I'm not sure what's going to be under there and I don't want to mess with it. He called a third plumber and the third plumber started, had his conversation. He said, you know what? I'll do it. And he asks him, why? Why would you do it? These other guys wouldn't do it. And he says, you know, I never know what I'm getting into and everything I do is hard. So I, if I didn't do the things that were hard and if I knew how everything was going to turn out, I'd never do anything. And he said, that guy changed my life. Because he said, I started to think about woodworking in that same way, that life just has challenges. Every project has a challenge. And when you start to deal with that reality and you start to say, you know what, there's going to be challenges, you start to have a different attitude towards things. And I was blessed as I watched that Put Me to Sleep video to think about that everything has a challenge, and pain and suffering and challenges are just part of life. That We don't go looking for them. We don't want them, but they're going to come. And that's exactly what happens when we're in a spiritual life with God. You're going to be under attack. You are going to have an enemy that's real. Pain and suffering are going to exist. But there is light and peace and joy. God gives us many pleasures in life. These things are all awesome. But don't get hung up on thinking that every moment should be that way. Because it isn't. We are broken people living in a broken world. In Ephesians chapter 6, 
we hear this, chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. That sounds pretty straightforward. We got challenges. We got enemies out there. We have all kinds of problems. And here's the deal. When you're attempting great things for the kingdom of God, the, the, the greater the thing that you're attempting, the greater the pushback by the enemy. It's just the reality of it. So, just to put this out there as a little bit of a challenge, if your life is a little bit too easy, maybe you're not attempting great things for the kingdom. If you're a little too comfortable, maybe God's trying to poke you today. Saying, take on a project for the kingdom, something bigger than you've thought you might be able to handle. Because if you're living in a place where you're too comfortable, that means that Satan's not poking on you ever. See, the battle is real. And my job, <laughs> this is interesting, I think I'm not a very good salesperson at this very moment. I'm supposed to be inviting people to come into this glorious ride of the kingdom of heaven, but I'm just trying to give it straight trying to tell you the way it really is. It's hard. Life is hard. And once you get over that, and once you address that, and once you acknowledge that reality, it sets you free. Yes, life is going to be hard. But I've got God on my side. The power of His Word is in me. It's going to be okay. God's got me. And my God is way bigger than all of the challenges that will come my way. So I want to do a couple of things here quick. I want to remind you that the enemy is real. Um, so I looked up this week, I looked up some of those words that would be Satan, synonyms thereof. So Satan is mentioned 33 times in the New Testament. The word demons is mentioned 82 times in the New Testament. The devil is mentioned 34 times in the New Testament. The concept of evil is mentioned 97 times in the New Testament. Does that sound like kind of our modern thought where we say, oh, well, we don't believe in forces of evil. We just kind of think God is a nice concept, and we, we don't really have to think about all of that stuff on the other side of the ledger. Don't be naive. Don't be naive. There is a personal and intelligent, powerful, complex, intelligent being who is fighting against you. And any time the, the kingdom of God nudges forward through words like love and grace and peace, the devil fights back with words like pride and hate and fear. There are two different sets of things that are occurring in the world constantly. Some are from God. The words I just mentioned, love and grace and peace. And there are other words that are just the opposite. Words like pride and hate and fear. And the question then becomes, who will you listen to and who will you side with? Many of you are familiar with the C.S. Lewis book, The Screwtape Letters. And Screwtape is this senior devil who's apprenticing this guy named Wormwood. And he tells, Screwtape tells Wormwood, he says, there's two things that we would like to have all of those believers do. One of them is to have an unhealthy interest in us and our dark powers. And the other, he says, is that they would have no interest whatsoever, that they wouldn't even believe that we are real two errors, one to be too interested in the things of darkness and the other to say that those aren't even real. In either case, the devil wins. I heard, uh, I've heard that there are some frogs in the world that will do this when they are threatened. They will either puff up and act bigger than they are or they will play dead in order to survive. Satan's the same way puffs himself up and makes himself look bigger than he really is 
And that's the first thing that C.S. Lewis was talking about. Or he'll play dead, and nobody will believe that he's a real force in the world. Either way, the devil wins. If you just think about it for a minute, and you go down past the surface, you know, Hitler was not the sole cause of the Holocaust. There's something underneath that. Underneath slavery is not simply racism or economics. There's something deeper. Underneath addictions, it's not just the excuse of bad parenting. There's evil in the world. And evil tries to keep all of those things in play all the time. Things like hatred and pride and fear. There are rulers and authorities and principalities of this dark world. And his attacks are not like what you might think. A lot of times if we think of evil, you know, we think of maybe if you were alive in the 70s or early 80s, you think of the exorcist and things like that, and you think that's what the devil looks like. But not really. Not really. I mean, yes, he can. He can, but he oftentimes looks very differently than that. Question for you. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? I want you to think about that for a second. Was it because, what was the first word out of John's mouth as he was preaching out in the desert? It was repent. Did Jesus have to repent? No. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? Well, he said, Jesus said, it's to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? Was it his own righteousness that he needed to fulfill? No. He needed to fulfill your righteousness. He needed to fulfill your righteousness because you can't do it. He needed to be the substitute for you and for I. He lived the life that you couldn't live. He died the death that you couldn't die. He rose in a way that you couldn't rise. See, what he's saying there is, I need to be a substitute for the people. Fulfilling all righteousness meant that he fulfilled all of our requirements for righteousness. And as soon as Jesus gets baptized, we hear this voice from heaven. And it's an interesting mashup. You know, it's kind of like the song that will put together this morning. It was kind of this contemporary, there's another in the fire leading into holy, holy, holy. I thought that was beautiful, by the way. Thank you all. It's a mashup. What God says from heaven about Jesus is a mashup. It's a mashup of Psalm 2, which is a coronation psalm. It was read when anybody from the line of David would be coronated as king. It said, this is my son, whom I'm, who I love. That was what was going on there. This voice from heaven is saying, I am coronating him as the king, one from the line of David. This is the one. And then he says something extremely different. It's such a mashup. It seems so weird. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 42. And Isaiah chapter 42 is one of the servant songs. And he uses the words, with him I am well pleased. But you know what was all surrounding with this, with him I am well pleased stuff? He was a man of sorrows. He had a disfigured appearance. There was no beauty in him. He was rejected. He was stritten, stritten, smitten, and afflicted. I literally, excuse me. (laughs) He was suffering. On his back, he bore the scars of the whole world. He's mashing up this Here is my son whom I'm anointing as king, and he's going to bear the sorrows of the entire universe. Wham! Smacks them all together in one little sentence from heaven. That's not what people were expecting out of their king. and It's not what you and I tend to expect out of a king either. But it's what we need. And so the frontal attacks that we get, the attacks that come at us most frequently are very different than we would think. The attacks that we think are Satan's going to appear and there's going to be a dark, ugly head that appears and I'm going to know that I should run away. It's not how it works. You know how it works? It's this. 
you try and create your own righteousness. You try and think that Jesus is a good example that I should follow. And if I power up and I do good enough and I'm a good enough moral person, I can make my own righteousness and I can get right with God. And a lot of us in this room try and play that game. Stop. God wants you to be a beggar saying, I need you. He doesn't want you to try and prove how good you are. Some of us are better than others. I get it, but guess what? None of us are righteous. No, not a one. Nobody in this room has enough righteousness to stand before God. You need a substitute. You need a substitute who could face all the temptations and didn't get sucked in. Because I don't know about you, but I get sucked in a lot. I do. And that's what drives me to my knees and says, Oh, God, I did it again. Forgive me today. I'm sorry. I know the stuff I'm supposed to do, and I don't do it. That's why when in our confession a little bit earlier, I had you read some scriptures that said we're a mess. Because we need to remember that. And not just mouth words. We need to see it from God's heart. How easily we get distracted. How easily we go astray. See, there's really two ways to look at Jesus. One is to think of him as an example. And the other is to say, he's my Savior. He's my Savior. I need Him. If you declare that He is your Savior, listen to some of the things from John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, To those who believe in His name, He gives the right to become the children of God. You're a child of God. The same thing that God said from heaven about Jesus, He's saying about you, that's my beloved son or daughter. With them I am well pleased. I love that kid. I love that guy. I love that gal. Not because they get it right all the time, but because they lean on Jesus. You know, if you want to take Jesus as your example, you're never going to get very far. As a matter of fact, you're going to get to where all the other religions of the world get to. Do. Do. Do this, do that. Then you'll be right with God. Do, do, do. You're just going to be in this big pile of do, do. That's where you're going to be. Christianity says, done. On the cross, for you. You don't have to try and be perfect. You just live a real life. And living a real life has challenges and is hard. And that's okay, because we know in the end it's all going to work out, because he's called us his children. So how do we fight? How do we fight this battle? Well, Ephesians 6 again, that talked about all the darkness and the principalities and the things that we're battling against, it says this towards the end of that chapter where it's talking about the armor of God. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What did Jesus get at his baptism? We saw the dove descend on him, and we saw the Word of God affirming him. He received the Spirit and the Word. And that's what Ephesians chapter 6 says to us. The Spirit and the Word are how we fight this battle. There's a lot of different verses in the Bible. A lot of different verses that will have lots of different things to say, but here's what you need to hold on to. You need to hold on to verses that remind you that you are His. And it's not because you're so great. It's because He is so great. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of your works, lest any man should... Yeah, you know it. Hold on to it. It's by His grace that you've been made right. It's by His grace that you're brought into fellowship with Him. There's a lot of verses that we could memorize that would tell us, be better, do more, and those are okay. 
They're good. God wants us to increasingly bear fruit and be increasingly look to Jesus as our example, but that has nothing to do with salvation. That has everything to do with being sanctified as we go, being made holy as we go. Temptations are going to come. They're going to be hard. And the more that you are in to some kingdom-extending ministry, even prayer life, that's a kingdom-extending ministry. The more that you are deeply committed to some kingdom-extending thing, the greater the attack will be. And the greater your reliance on the Word of God will need to be. So it's important. It's important to do what Jesus did. And he would say things like, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. And then the devil left him. See, the then didn't go on forever. Jesus went from this water into the desert. And then the devil left him. He will come and go in your life. He will. Some days will be hard, and other days will not be as hard. But in the end, there is ultimate victory. There is ultimate victory. Your battle will continue until the great then, when Jesus comes with all power and glory and returns. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, we read this, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Just a big reminder. You are God's child. And when Jesus got that moniker, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, boom, stuff started. It hit the wall, as it, say, as it were, and things were troublesome. But then the devil left him. The devil will leave you too as you continue to rely on the promises of God. Continue to cogitate on how good He is. Let's pray. Lord, even as You were led by the Spirit into the desert, and You were tempted and harassed and challenged by Satan, we too feel the sting. We feel the temptation. Help us, Lord, to store up those promises in our hearts that when Satan attacks, that You would come with Your authoritative Word and that you would give us comfort and hope and peace until the day when we see you with the great then of your return. We call out on the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.